Um, Vera, I'm going to blame you for my sermon series that we're about to embark on. Um, it's a new year, and we're starting a new series. We finished Philippians last time I was here uh, in the pulpit two weeks ago. And um, in one of our previous classes, uh, Vera asked me, what did, what did Jesus mean by worshiping in spirit and truth? And I, I gave her sort of a haphazard answer um, at the time. But it got me thinking, and um, actually this whole sermon series that I'm going to do came out of that, um, meditating on that and, you know, looking into the scriptures and got me thinking along a certain line. So um, it's, if you guys don't like it, blame her. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> one of the things that our church is known for is that we dig deep into the scriptures that we try to uncover every, every stone, we try to get all the nuggets and all the juices that we can get out of a particular uh, passage of scripture. And we, we want to learn as much as we can possibly learn about God, about who he is, um, and about what he has done, and what his future plans are. I mean, do you wanna know what he is going to do and where you fit into all of that? Sure you do. It gives you a sense of purpose in life, doesn't it? Uh, to, to know that you're part of something big. But one thing that there's a danger in that. There's a danger in spending all our time just learning about God. Because there is an enormous difference between knowing about God and knowing God. Isn't that right? You can study a lot about God. President Obama, and you might know almost everything there is to know about him. You might actually know where he was born, which half the country doesn't seem to know that. But you might learn a lot of things about him, but that doesn't mean you know him. You know, the same can be said of anybody. And, you know, in our previous hour, we studied the scriptures and we're learning what the Bible has to say. And it's, it's very important that we understand God's word, as I said. It's very, very important. And you do come to know God up to a point by studying his word, by studying um, what he has done, the, char you know, the characteristics of his nature, and all these kinds of things. We do learn to know God up to a point. But it, you must come to the place where we begin to actually encounter him on a more personal level. Would you guys agree with that? We have to encounter him. And we need to know him, not just know about him. And I think, to be perfectly honest, and it's probably mostly my fault, but if we're lacking in that area, it's because I have focused maybe not too much on you know, expository teaching of the scriptures, but we need to folk, our, our, our church uh, time of worship here should be balanced so that we spend time learning, yes, but then we spend time interacting. Because really, our worship is supposed to be an interaction with God, it's personal. God has revealed himself throughout the Bible in very personal ways. I mean, if you look at how he appeared to Abraham and spoke to him and made promises to him, it wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, I'm this big God and, you know, and I'm just giving you a bunch of facts about me or I'm gonna wow you with my power or something like that. He came down and spoke to Abraham face to face and he made some very personal promises to Abraham about how he was going to have a son and how God was going to you know make of that son a great nation and how his whole plan was going to come through that son that he was going to have and the Messiah would come and all of that and so God has throughout history even with Moses and with many others he has been very personal and of course that's all been recorded for us so we can learn about it but you know God wants to be personal with us too not just with Bible characters now I'm not saying he's gonna show up in a human form and talk to you face to face I'm not saying you're gonna hear voices or see a vision alright but the New Testament talks a great deal about the local church the local congregation of believers and how we are supposed to in our worship be encountering God and we've been pretty uh, lax in that area to be perfectly honest with you guys and I want that to change 
Not that we're going to get all mystical and spooky on you or anything like that, because we're not. All right, but we are going to focus more on prayer, and we're going to focus more on interacting with God and inviting his spirit to be here present amongst us and in worshiping him in a way that is not just going through the motions. You know, how many, how many, I think all of you guys have been in churches where you get the sense that we're just going through the motions. We're singing these same old songs, we're saying these words, and our mind is a million miles away, you know, and we did church today, I'm done, I did my church thing, you know, I'm going to go home. And um, there's really no substance to that. We need to know God in a more personal, in a more personal way. So I, here's my question to you guys. What is worship? The word worship is used quite a few times in the Bible. What is worship? What is the meaning of worship? Does anybody have any ideas you want to throw out at me? Yeah, Kathy. Adoration? Adoration? Um, no, that's part of it. That's sort of skirting it, though. That's not really the central idea. Okay, that's actually in submission, but yes. Some people think that worship is in a particular hour on Sunday, <laughs> right? From 11 to 12 on Sunday, or in our case, on Saturday night. Or, or what's that? Yeah, or they think it's just, right, some people think it's a celebration. Some people think worship is a pep rally. You know, we get all excited about God, and that's worship. And yeah, Vera? Yeah, it, it, yes, you're on the right track. You and Walter are both on the right track. But before I get to that, I want to point out that worship is not a style of music, okay? You go to the Christian bookstore and they have the worship section, right? It's a style of music that kind of makes you feel good, like you're floating along on a cloud and praising God. Okay, that's not what worship is. It had, right, it has to do with the relationship. Walter was actually right on the money. The, the actual definition of the Greek word in the Bible literally means to bow down, prostrate before someone. That is, you know how the Muslims pray? You, you guys have seen Muslims pray, right? They, get, they, they have their little rug that they put down on the floor. Let me see if I can do this. <clears throat> I'm not a Muslim, and I'm not advocating Islam. Okay. But they do this when they pray. You seen that? And they get up, and they get down, and they get up, and they get down. Well, what does that mean? Are we supposed to pray that way? Yes, you're exactly right, Thelma. It's a symbolic way of saying, I am your slave, I am your servant, right? It's a symbolic way of saying, I submit myself totally to you. You are my master. That's what it means. And that's what worship really is. It's not a style of music. It's not a fuzzy feeling, it's not a pep rally, and it's not an hour that we come to on Sunday or Saturday. Worship is submission to God. Now, submission to God, can you have submission to someone that you do not have a personal relationship with? How can you, you, you have to, because submission requires an interaction, doesn't it? Requires an interaction between two parties. One who submits his will to the will of another. And submission then would require what? Obedience. It requires obedience. Because it's, if you just put your, you know, your face on the floor and your, and your hands out like that, it doesn't mean anything. What is important is what's in your heart and whether your heart is truly humble and submissive before God. That's what real worship is. You cannot worship unless... You have the fear of the Lord in your heart. You cannot worship unless you have a proper evaluation of who God is, of his character, of his greatness, of his qualities, his being merciful and loving and just and all those things. You cannot worship God unless you understand those things, because those are the reasons why we're worshiping him. Because those things are so great and good. And you cannot have proper worship unless you have a proper evaluation of yourself. Of what man is. That we are but dust, as David says in the Psalms. Right? And how, when we approach God, 
We cannot approach God in arrogance. We cannot approach God in pride. We can, what did you, remember the parable that Jesus gave of the two guys who went up the temple to worship? Right? One guy said, I thank thee, O God, that I'm not like this publican over here. You know, he's such a dirtbag. And I'm so holy. And then the publican, he was beating his breast and saying, what? God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, which one went away forgiven? It was the humble guy. The proud guy, no. He thought he was holy, but he wasn't. Pride is one of the th things that God hates. In fact, if you look at the list of things God hates in the, in the Proverbs, pr pride is number one. Remember what, um, what it says in James, God resists the proud, and he gives grace to the humble. Isn't that right? I always, I always like to bring that verse up when I talk to Calvinists. Calvinists believe that God has chosen, elect certain people to be saved, and other people he has chosen to condemn to hell. And you ask him, well, how did God choose? who he's going to save and who he's going to condemn because, you know, supposedly their choice has nothing to do with it. It's just God's choice. And, uh, well, it's some mysterious will of God that we can't possibly figure out. Well, the Bible tells us who God ordains to life and who God condemns. It, he tells us, right? He resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. There it is. That's how God chooses. He chooses the humble. So what does James say to do? Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and then he'll lift you up. That's easy. It's not some big complicated thing about election. That's, that's how election works, right there. Anyway, let's read, uh, let's go to John chapter 4. In this passage, Jesus was um, talking to the woman at the well, the woman of Samaria. <clears throat> and uh, let's look at verse, uh, let's begin in verse 10. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. You should underline living water. All right, I'll tell you what to underline so that you'll know that uh, it's an important word. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Does anybody know where living water comes from? It comes from the Old Testament. Does anybody know? Kathy is nodding her head, yes. Yes. <laughs> You're waving at me again. Um, where does living water come from? Yes. In the, in the kingdom, when Christ returns and he establishes his kingdom in Jerusalem, and it says that this living water is going to flow out of the throne of God and flow down, and it's going to heal the land, and, the, and it's going to flow into the Dead Sea, and the, and, the, and the Dead Sea will be healed, and it will produce all these fish. It goes on and on and on about this living water that's going to completely change and alter the landscape in Christ's kingdom. Well, Jesus uses that, meta that as a metaphor here. He says, I'm going to give you some living water. Well, a Jew looking at that, he would know that that living water is what turns the desert into a lush garden in the prophecies. And if God is going to give me that living water, what's that going to do to me? It's going to turn a parched desert into a lush garden. That's why Jesus used that expression here, right? So, let's continue. He says, um, verse, um, verse 11, thank you, Walter. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well, and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become, notice this, in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Now, I've told you guys this many times in the past. When he talks about everlasting life, what is he talking about? The resurrection. The resurrection. That's right. Eternal life is the resurrection. It is when we will be raised from the dead, never to die again. That's what eternal life means. It means to not die. It means immortality. So this, he's going to give us this living water, which is flowing, springing up like a spring coming up out of the ground in us. And the result of this is eternal life. That is, it, it's unto eternal 
life. That's where it's going to go. So there is a connection here between the living water that he gives us as a fountain and everlasting life and the, and the resurrection and living with God uh, forever, right? Let's continue. Verse 15. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is searching such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Now, I want you to notice that little word must in that last verse that I read. Must. In the Greek, it literally means they are required to worship him in spirit and in truth. That's what it means. They are required to worship him in spirit and truth. It's a certain kind of worship that is necessary as opposed to a kind of worship that is, doesn't mean anything. Notice he said to you, you worship what you don't know. You know you, he said this to the Samaritan woman. You don't really know who you're worshiping. It's ignorant. It's an ignorant kind of worship. The implication is you need to know who you're worshiping. Isn't that right? And then he's saying there's this time is coming and it's now. It's, it's, it's almost here is essentially what he means. When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him. In spirit and truth. So it's critical if, if Jesus said we must, if we're going to worship him, we must worship him in spirit and truth. We need to know what he meant by worshiping the Father in spirit and truth. Isn't that right? We need to know that. What does that mean? Well, what does he mean? What does Jesus mean by living water? Let's start there. Living water. It's going to be a spring coming up. And it's going to result in eternal life for us. What does he mean by living water? Did you know that just a couple of chapters later, Jesus went on to talk about living water one more time. And he associated with something very important. So let's go over to chapter 7. Keep your finger there, though, because we're coming back. John chapter 7, verse 37. <clears throat> On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, quote, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. It's the same idea that he said to the woman. He said there will be a spring springing up, which means a constant, <coughs> excuse me, a constant flow of living water. Here it's a river flowing out because it's, a, it's got a constant or a continuous source. So what is this living water? He goes on. John comments on it. See, you notice that what I just read is in, is in red letters. That was Jesus' words. But in the next verse, John, who's writing this down, tells us what Jesus meant. Here's what he said. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So Jesus spoke of this in the future. He spoke of it here in the future. And when he spoke to the woman at the well, he spoke of it in the future. The time is coming, right? That's what he said. So the living water that Jesus talked about was the Holy Spirit's presence within us, which we learn uh, if we continue reading through the book of Acts, we learn that on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was given. The Holy Spirit came upon uh, the church, the early uh, Christian congregation there, and brought them power and so forth. 
So the Holy Spirit is the living water that he was talking about. He was using living water as a metaphor for the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus says to her, those who worship, the, worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth, spirit there, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. We must worship God in the Holy Spirit. Well, what does that mean, in the Holy Spirit? And why does he say, in spirit and in truth? Spirit and truth. Are those two things go together? You know, when Jesus, in, uh, in John chapter 16, when Jesus well, was at the Last Supper with his disciples, he said he was going to send them the spirit of truth. Oh, yes, he put those two terms together, didn't he? He called the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth. Um, that's actually in John 16, 13. You can jot that down if you want to. Now, I want you to take your Bibles and go to Ephesians chapter 2, please. Yes, I'm going to tie all this up together, hopefully. And hopefully it won't take too long to do it. Because I know everybody's hungry. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. I actually should have backed up a couple of verses. Let's go back to verse 14. For he himself, that is Christ, is our peace, who has made both one. And both there refers to the Jews and the Gentiles, that is the Jews who believed and the Gentiles who believed. He has made both one and has broken down the middle walls of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting uh, to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, that was to the Gentiles, and those who were near, that was the Jews. For through him we both have access by, and notice this, by one spirit to the Father. Oh, wait a minute. You know, we have, the, the, um, we have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit right there in that passage, don't we? He came and preached, Jesus came and preached peace to you who were far off and those who were near, and through him, that is through Jesus, we both have access by one Spirit, there's the Holy Spirit, to the Father. So we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all involved here in our access to, to God. Now, if you do not have access to God, what do you have? Nothing. Nothing of any value. Isn't that right? You got nothing of any value. Isn't God the source of life? Is he the source of every breath you take? Is he the source of every good and perfect gift that comes down from above, as James says? Right? Isn't he the one who gives you power to get wealth? Isn't he the one who gives you health, who gives you everything? Everything good comes from him. If you have no access to him, what do you got? Nothing. You're in a world of hurt. How does the Apostle Paul say we have access to the Father? Through the Spirit, we have access to the Father. All right? That's very important. Well, let's continue reading. Um, and I lost my place. What verse was I in, Walter? 19. What was it? 19. Is okay, 19. Um, that doesn't look right. Wait a minute. Oh, yes, I, I am, that is correct. Sorry. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. That is, the Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners to God, and they now have access to God, the God of Israel. But fellow citizens with the saints, that's the saints of the Old Testament, and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now, notice this. In whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. What in the world is he talking about? Well, he's using, he's using an allegory here of a, the building of a temple. A temple was a place of worship of God. 
And he's saying that the church, the local assembly of people, this body of people here now, is a temple of God, and God seeks to dwell in our midst, in our presence, and he is putting together this temple for that purpose. And every local church that belongs to God is intended for the purpose to be a temple to God and that God would dwell in our midst. Now, that's very important when it comes to worship, isn't it? God's presence. Which is why when at the beginning of the service when we prayed, I asked, I invited God to be present among us by his spirit. It was an invitation to him. All right, that's very important. But what's important, what I want you to grasp here is that he's not saying in this passage that each one of you is a temple of the Holy Spirit. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that all of us are individual components in the construction of a temple that God can then dwell in the midst of us and among us as a group, as a body, as a collective whole. All right? So when some of us come every week and some of us stay home half the time, half the blocks of the temple aren't here. You know? That's, that's what's going on. All right, well, let's keep going. The collective congregation is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You know what the word church means? And the, the, well, actually, the English word, it's irrelevant. But the word that's in the Bible that's translated church is in the Greek, it's ekklesia. It comes from two words. It comes from kaleo, which is a verb which means to summon someone to uh, a collective gathering. Like to send out an invitation and summon people to come together at one location for a particular event. And it's prefixed by the word ek, which is a preposition which means out from. So what it means is you are summoned to come out from your homes to gather together as an assembly of people for a purpose. That's what the word means. The word church or ecclesia does not mean this building. And contrary to what a lot of Christians believe, they think, oh, well, the church is the people. Yes and no. We are the church when we are assembled together. Because that's what the word really means. Ecclesia does not mean individual people who have a membership at a particular club and they're all out doing their own thing. That's not the church. All right, Ecclesia is an event. Can you, get, can you grasp that? It's an event. It's an occasion where we leave our homes and we gather together for the purpose of worship of God. That's what the church is. All right? And whenever that word appears in the Bible, that's what it means. And it's been so twisted by bad theology down through the years, and it's, it's, it's developed a lot of baggage, that isn't true. What it means is the event that we're doing right now. We're doing church right now. That's what the word means, okay? So, <clears throat> if you're at home, while we're here, are you part of the church? No, you're not. You're not part of the church unless you're here when we're assembled together to worship God. Which means our online ministry, we have a big online ministry. There are lots of people all over who are listening to my sermons and they're watch or they're watching the videos of the sermons are they part of this church no not really not according to the real meaning of the word because if they were they would have to be here they would be participating along with us in the worship of God so if you stay home because you don't feel like going and you say I'll just watch it later on the internet after Tim posts it on the internet, you're not at church, and you're not part of the church unless you're here. I just want you guys to know that. That's really the meaning of the term. All right? That's how it's used in the Bible. Yes? Yes. Well, they have, a, they, like the ones we saw on here a little while ago, Ben and his group there at Peoria, Illinois, they've got about, what, six adults and, I don't know, three or four children that are gathered together, and they worship God 
together. Is that church? Yes, it absolutely is. That's church. So you have to have an assembly of people who understand God, who understand what worship is, and who come together to engage in that activity as a body of believers. That's church. All right? Let's just make sure we understand that. So um, the TV is not a substitute for church. The Internet is not a substitute for church. Um, you know, listening to some CD is not a substitute for church. You must participate in order to be part of the church. All right? That's very important. And in the Bible, in the New Testament, there's no such thing as individual Christian who just goes off and does his own thing. And it's just, you know, it's between me and God. You know, I have a relationship with God. Well, the relationship you're supposed to have is not just with God. It's with God's people, and it's to worship God, and you worship God in the congregation. That's how uh, we're supposed to be worshiping God. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I have to pick up the pace here because I'm already over time. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. For no other foundation can anyone lay than which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Do you not know that you are the temple of God? Now, you there is a collective plural. It's talking about collectively, you as a group. You are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you, or that is among you. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Oh, wow. We're going to come and worship God and be the temple for the Holy Spirit. And if we come and we defile God's temple, that's a pretty harsh warning, isn't it? Isn't it? Does that tell us how serious this is, what we're doing? It's serious. Yeah, Walter. Yeah. 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 And uh, there's also the case in the same book where Paul talks about uh, those who were um, observing the communion time, and they were doing it in a way that was dishonoring to God. And God says that it's for this reason that many among you are sick, and some even sleep. That is, they have died. God had already brought judgment into His house because some people were defiling the worship time. It's a very serious thing to gather together in the presence of God. We should take this very, very seriously to worship God. And when we come to worship God, we don't come with our arrogance and our pride or anything like that. We come in a humble and submissive attitude. That's what worship is. And we bow down before him, metaphorically speaking, of course, and we submit to him, which means we obey him. We obey him. That's critically important. But you know, back there in John 4, Jesus said that the true worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. What is truth? Well, truth is God's word. Truth is also, I guess, I mean, you would say, purity and holiness. I don't know. I reach not. I'm going to read to you. You're, you're pretty close, Walter. Uh, 2 Corinthians, you don't turn there because we don't have time. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now, the apostle, this was the Apostle Paul's ministry. He was telling what he did in his ministry. What does Paul do? He says, I am overthrowing strongholds and I'm casting down arguments that have exalted themselves against the proper knowledge of God. So the truth that Paul strove for was to proclaim who God was accurately, to proclaim who we are 
accurately, to proclaim the gospel accurately, and to overthrow all those false teachings that were intended to deceive people so that they cannot worship God in spirit and in truth. And the deceiver is out there doing that all the time. He's weaving together all kinds of false teachings so that, and there, some of them sound pretty good. You know, they got some pretty good arguments going on. That's the arguments Paul's talking about that he's overthrowing. He's casting that down. The deception that exalts itself against the proper and true knowledge of God must be overthrown. Which means, if we are going to worship God in spirit and in truth, we must have a pretty good handle on truth. Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, you worship the one you don't even know. And that's what a lot of people are doing. They're worshiping a God they don't really know. And the God that they think he is isn't the God he actually is. They think he's a lot different than he actually is. They don't know what he's doing. They don't know why he's doing it. And it's because they haven't studied the word of God and they haven't studied the scriptures. We need to know God. We need to understand God. That's why knowledge of the scripture is critically important to worship. But we have to take it a step beyond just knowing about God and we have to start engaging God by prayer, by worship, by singing to him. You notice the songs, um, almost all the songs that we sang today were addressing God directly. Did you notice that? I think those kinds of songs are important. Not all songs are that way. Some songs are kind of testimonials about God. I like the songs where, where you are actually addressing God and you're singing to God and you're telling him what you feel in your heart and you hopefully you feel the hopefully those songs move you right i hope <laughs> but we're expressing that to god and those songs are intended to stir up some of those things that we ought to be feeling and thinking about god and get us to think about them so that we can respond to god's love and to uh, what god has done for us i got to wrap this thing up here because i'm going way long james 4 and we're done james 4 verse 1 <clears throat> where do fights and uh, excuse me where do wars and fights come from among you oh really were, were there uh, he's ready with the churches now were there wars and fights going on in churches yes yeah did they have problems in the early church yes. yeah he read, read the book of corinthians that church was a mess it was a mess right so he's saying, uh, where does all this come from? All this disunity and the arguing and the bickering and all the junk that's going on, where does all that come from? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? That is, people wanting to please themselves. You lust and you, not, and you do not have. That is, you want this or you want that and you got to have this and you got to have that. And you don't have it. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. Asking is part of our worship. Okay? You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss. That is for the wrong motives. That you may spend it on your pleasures. Oh God, I need a new BMW because my car, the paint's peeling on it. Right? You just want you want to um, you know, satisfy your craving for, you know, whatever. God doesn't answer those kinds of prayers, is what he's saying. But look what he says next. Verse 4. Adulterers and adulteresses. This is what he's calling Christians. Now, he doesn't mean it literally. He doesn't mean that they were, you know, messing around with the neighbor's wife. He means that their, the way that they were behaving before God was spiritual adultery. The, the Old Testament is full of this kind of language. The book of Hosea is all about it. Worshipping idols, putting other things before God, all that was considered adultery. So he, he calls them adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself the enemy of God. So choose which you want. You want to be the friend of the world? You're the enemy of God. You want to be the friend of God? You're the enemy of the world. That's it. Or do you not think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us, and the word in there can be translated either in or among. And I believe it means among here. The spirit who dwells among us yearns jealously. But he gives more grace. Therefore he says, quote, 
God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I love that verse. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now, if we're going to come and worship God in spirit and truth, two things we need to know. You can't worship God unless you have the truth, unless you know who he is, who you are, and you have a sense of what he has done for us. Number two, you can't worship him without his spirit. You can't do it. If his spirit isn't here among us and is not free to move among us, we're not worshiping God. We're not really worshiping God. God wants us to interact with him. But if we come to interact with him and we invite him to come into our presence and to, and to um, invade this temple of God, which is this gathering of people, and to fill this place with his Holy Spirit, we have to come based on what he commands. We have, to, we have to come in submission to him, to his will, that our lives are being, that we're living our lives in submission to him. If we come any other way with pride or anything like that, God's spirit is not going to be present among us. He's just not. He's just not going to come here. All right, I'm not saying each of us don't have the spirit dwelling in us. We do. But this collective that he's talking about here, where God wants to dwell among this group of people collectively and move amongst us so that we see things happening. We see prayers being answered. We see God's blessings coming. And we see people becoming Christians. We see something happening here. That's only going to come if God's presence comes among us. And if his presence is here, we have all that we need. Isn't that right? So, we have to, when we come before him, we must be reverent and we must approach him in the way he says we must approach him. Isn't that right? All right Walter, then we've got to close. Yeah, yeah, we're going to go a sermon on that one too. Any, any sins in our life, we need to mm -hmm. confess, repent of, yeah. become clean before You're giving away my sermon, Walter. Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> I have a sermon on that coming up. Okay. Yes. It's from the psalm. I think it's 46 or something. But um, <laughs> Yeah, we'll talk about that. We're going to be talking more about aspects of worship and what God requires of us. And if we are obedient and we really are submissive to him in the way that the word worship really means, we will see God moving here and doing things that when we ask, we'll see things happening. If nothing is happening and we keep asking and nothing is happening, it's because the problem's with us. It's not with God. All right. All right.